So welcome everyone. I'm Maureen Golden, your host for today's webinar, and it's an honor to be here with each of you. The hosting organization, Sociocracy for All, also known as SOFA, is a nonprofit that works to make sociocracy accessible to everyone by creating resources, offering communities of practice, and doing online training. SOFA has some staff and about 60 volunteer members. Our guests today are Yuta Ekstein and John Buck, who will be presenting about Agile Bossa Nova, an unrecipe for thinking outside the box with beyond budgeting, open space, sociocracy, and Agile. I am really excited to be collectively embarking on this one hour exploration into John and Yuta's book, as I believe their framework is a huge gift for our globally interconnected world that is trying to adjust to the rapidly increasing pace and scale of change. Although we are 30 or 40 years into the information revolution, Celine Ismail, the founding executive director of Singularity University, asserts that we are actually only 1% in, that we are like literally just starting and that most of this disruption is actually ahead of us. And fundamentally, we are not ready for it. And here's why. All of the rules we have learned to play by in order to be successful no longer apply because we have been thrust into a new game. And here's the challenge. Although companies recognize that they exist in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous VUCA world, there are no overarching concepts in terms of strategy, structure, and, pro and processes to orient and guide them in navigating this new terrain. And that is what Boston Nova Framework seeks to provide. This webinar is structured as a presentation with time for Q&A at the end. And the room will remain open after the webinar for anyone who would like to stay and chat. We want this time to be meaningful and engaging for you within the constraint of only one hour of time and lots of information to share. Therefore, we encourage you to add your questions to the Q&A, which is at the bottom of your toolbar. There's a thing called Q&A. So if you put your questions in there while Yuta and John are presenting, and you have the capacity to upvote other people's questions by clicking the thumbs up symbol. Um, we won't be responding to hand raising and we won't really be monitoring the chat. So if you could please just focus on using the Q&A. And with that introduction, I'd love to turn it over to John and Yuta. Welcome everybody. I assume that some of you are uh, consultants advising clients on new leading edge management methods. And some of you may have read our book and are simply curious about what we have to say. And more of you may be looking to make your companies and organizations more agile. So today, Yuta and I will be suggesting like another level of ideas you can offer your clients or your organization and try to meet your curiosity by expanding your scope of thinking. Um, you can see on the title of the book here that we have a lot of buzzwords crammed into the title of our book. And we could have included a lot more, you know, we could have put this whole long title taking up the whole page of buzzwords. Um, we, uh, we noted that uh, each of the originators uh, of these buzzwords says, my buzzword is a hammer that can hit all nails. And we decided that actually the world needs a combination of different principles. The, uh, another buzzword is, is VUCA. Uh, we, we live in a volatile, uncertain, and complex and ambiguous world. Um, from the VUCA standpoint, we all use software. The software is eating the world and it, it chews on us. And as it does, it's disrupting everything. Uh, in a sense, we're all software companies in the midst of a, of a digital revolution. And these VUCA circumstances invite companies and organizations to be nimble alive uh, so they can thrive. Uh, we, uh, Yuta will now introduce some principles and values that support this uh, approach of agility. And later in the session, we'll invite you to think how you can personally use these principles and values uh, yourself. So to you, Yuta. Yeah, so as John said, this book of world really ask companies to be agile in a real literal sense, meaning that they're responsive, adaptive, nimble, 
um, all of that. And if we think of a company being agile, then the first thing at least comes to my mind, being somebody who comes out of the agile field, is the values that have been defined for agile software development. So the values you are seeing right here, right now, and, and we know that not everyone is coming from the actual world here in this webinar. Um, yet those actual values have been defined by something that's called the actual manifesto. However, as, as I said, those values have been defined for software development. So the big question is, what are the values stand for company-wide agility? What values are important for companies that really want to respond to that request of being agile in this worker world in order to survive and thrive. And looking at the first um, value uh, comparison at the top, individuals and interactions is what drives an agile team and not processes and tools. So for a company, this basically means it should rely on self-organization. And um, because it is the people making up the company who ensure that they are responsive to all the changes that are coming up. Looking at the second value, which says working software over comprehensive documentation, and actually here we have immediately the, the software part in it, and now we are looking for what does it mean for the whole company. Actually, in the software world, this working software value that's driving more than comprehensive documentation is nothing else than making transparent what is the status of the product we are actually working on. Because you can have tons of documentation or you can follow any kinds of checklists and so on, but only the working system, the working product really tells the truth about the status of the product. So therefore, what we are talking about here really, and this is also the translation for company-wide agility, we're talking about transparency. Then the next one is kind of an easy thing, which is, just says customer collaboration is what drives us and not contract negotiation. So what it means on the company-wide level is that we always should focus on the customer or putting it in our words, constant customer focus. So whatever we do, everything should be aligned to help the customer to um, get better or to be successful in, in the world. Now the last one, responding to change over following a plan, actually responding to change is the thing that you need to do in order to really respond to this VUCA challenge. And you can only do so by continuously learning. So only if you learn from the change that's coming on, uh, coming into your space and also from the stuff that you have done so far, you can really survive in this change world. Now, with these values and principles, the, which now go really kind of directly back to the Agile Manifesto. We, we are very clear that we are not the only ones who have figured that out. So self-organization, transparency, constant customer focus, and continuous learning are really values that are important for, I would say nowadays, really every company. And these are values a lot of different disciplines have already tackled and tried how to implement those. And John will now go over a few of those and um, what they are offering. So this is kind of what we brought together. So this, this diagram here um, kind of synopsizes our, our Goldilocks approach to um, the, the way we came out with the methods uh, that are in the, the title of the book. Uh, we looked for methods that were not too philosophical and not too specific, and, and if speaking of Goldilocks, I already slept in. That means somebody is already using the method that we were selecting to run a company. So for example, in the lower left-hand corner here, um, there are various theories like theory U that are very inviting, 
but nobody's really using it to operate their company. Um, in the upper left, we, there are many happy companies in this list, but they're not really generalized, although all this is changing. Semco has just come out with a, something called a Semco Institute. Um, the, on the um, lower right, you can uh, are listed three things and we chose open space because companies are using open space to run their companies, but they're not using World Cafe or Appreciative Inquiry. Um, we looked at the, the, the another number of egalitarian methods that are listed in the upper right. And what we did there is we tried to choose original methods because we noted that the, the literature for the original methods seems to be richer, more people writing about it than the the spin-off of, of those methods. So for example, we chose uh, Beyond Budgeting rather than the spin-off called Beta Codex. And we chose Sociocracy rather than Holacracy or Sociocracy 3.0. I would like to jump in just sure. quickly, which is in case you think you look at this uh, map and you think, well, but why didn't they put on X, Y, Z? The thing is, this picture is really a snapshot and it's so hard to keep up. So there is, there is stuff evolving almost all the time. And it's not a complete picture of what is out there. It is a picture of kind of some examples that are in different areas. So only to ensure that you're not expecting us to have this like a full fledged complete picture. Finally, uh, note that we uh, kind of in the background incorporated a number of methods such as uh, human systems dynamics, design thinking, lean startup, and Kinefin uh, to help us in we, when we were combining the methods, trying to synthesize them. And so we ended up with a monomic uh, BASA, uh, which is kind of fun because uh, the um, bossa nova is a kind of dance, and we use the dance analogy throughout the book. When, when you're dancing, you are listening to music and incorporating it. You're also influencing other people as you're dancing. Uh, bossa nova is Portuguese for new wave, and um, so it, it just seemed like that was a kind of a neat name to, to call it. Uh, the B stands for beyond budgeting, OS for open space, S for sociocracy and, and A for agile. There's and maybe one more thing, which is Bossa Nova is also a style of music. And in this style, it's a fusion of samba and cool jazz. And in the same way, what we have done, it's a fusion or a synthesis. The, um, so Yuta, why don't you continue on and talk a little bit more about, uh, the, for people right. who are not, not familiar with all these methods, uh, what's in them? Sure. Let's dive into the first one, which is beyond budgeting. Um, beyond budgeting suffers a little bit from its name because everyone thinks it's about budgets only. However, it's actually not. It's really more a management model. So the real definition is what you see on this slide, a management model that is more empowered and adaptive. And with that, it supports, for example, self-organization or transparency or trust or autonomy. So a, a lot of these values we have talked about earlier. Yet at the core, there is budgeting because the people who have actually discovered it, so it hasn't been invented or created, it was more a discovery process for CFOs, so chief financial operators, who um, found out what's working and what's not in terms of budgets. And um, if you think about budgets for organizations or companies, then, well, most often we do it only once per year, which is already not really agile, adaptive, nimble, responsive, speaking of that what the VUCA world really expects. Um, but even more so, uh, a classic budget actually serves three different purposes. So at first, it serves the purpose that we are um, trying to explain what do we want to achieve. So that's our target. And forget about what's in parentheses for now. So what do we want to achieve? That's what we express in the target. But it's not the only, only thing what we have in the 
budget. So the other purpose of a budget is what do we think will happen? That's called a forecast. And then the third thing is where do we really want to spend our money? So that would be resource allocation. And for everyone who really hates that term resource, I know that people in the actual community, they really hate it. They think like, okay, human resources, HR, it's, it's wrong because it's about people. Be assured that here we are talking finance. We are not talking about people. We talk about, okay, where do we really invest the money in? Now, once you understood that the budget actually, although it's like one budget, it fulfills really three purposes, you can deal with these three purposes in different ways. For example, you can start having not absolute but relative targets, which makes a lot more sense, especially in the book cover world. Let me give you an example here. It, it's definitely a simple example, but I, I think it really helps. So. Um, Imagine I'm a salesperson and I have to sell like a hundred units of anything and in, in a year. And if I do, then I will get my bonus. Now imagine that after the year is done, I really have sold a hundred units. So this is great. I get my bonus. Yeah, lucky me. However, what is if our competitor has sold 200 units, then probably I didn't really do so well, but I still get my bonus. Or what happens if our competitors has sold only 20 units, then I did extremely well, but still neither the target nor not the, not the bonus are really expressing that. Therefore, what's really in that book cover really important is to have relative targets so they flow with the changes. They, they are adaptive to the changes. Now for the forecast, actually, the thing where we explore what we think will happen, this makes only sense if we look at this more often than once per year, because things are changing. And so whenever there's a change, at least then, we should look at the forecast again and see if this is all fine still. Uh, another possibility is to have a rolling forecast. So you regularly look at, oh, do we still think this is happening or has anything changed? And for the resource allocation, which is kind of a de uh, derivative of the forecast, this should be then be done dynamically and not fixed in a, like a year in advance. Um, I see that question if we are speaking about how to operationalize this. Actually, yes, we do. Um, this is kind of the, the second part of the presentation. So at the moment we are with principles and values and later we are talking about the, um, yeah, how to implement that. You, you tied, I spoke with someone one time whose company was using uh, beyond budgeting, and they said it was great. If they start a new project, the budget people were right there saying, how can we get you money? As opposed to like, no, 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 you can't do it for another six months. Uh, right, so it works right, really well. right. So the, what, what beyond budgeting folks are often saying, if you only do a yearly budget, it's like a bank has opened only one day per year. And if you are coming a day late, then better luck. You have to wait another year, which is kind of what you're saying right now with this example. Okay, let's get on, uh, move on to the uh, next one, which is open space. And open space is actually um, kind of well known in uh, the facilitation area. So uh, again, because I don't know who is really there and who knows um, about these things. So open space in the facilitation space um, actually is something that has been created based on the fact that people after a conference often say the best part of the conference were the breaks, which is kind of bad for everyone who puts a lot of energy in the program. Yet it seems that people really get the most out of conferences when they are networking with people in, for example, breaks. And so open space takes whatever breaks do for you at a conference and makes this um, a system, or maybe even you make a 
a conference in itself by using open space format, which is actually also known, some people might know it, know it better as an unconference. And if you think about what's happening in a break, it is, well, everyone can suggest a topic people will talk about at if they are standing at the coffee table, for example. It's not that people say, okay, at this table, we will only speak about blah, 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 but not about something else. Then also people just start discussing whenever they want and they stop discussing about that topic also whenever they feel it's done. And um, then also the discussion can happen not at the coffee table, but maybe during a stroll outside. So what we have so far is everyone can suggest a topic and idea by just talking about it, by just doing it. Then it starts when it starts, it ends when it ends. It can happen like anywhere. So also the location isn't necessarily fixed. Then there is one other thing which is a, a called a law in open space, which is that um, whenever you feel in a break discussion, that people are now talking about stuff, well, you're not really interested in. You kind of been there, done that, and um, it's nothing for you to learn or to contribute. Then what typically people do, and you might do that as well, you might say, oh, I look for another coffee, and you just wander off and join a different coffee table. This is what's called in open space, the law of two feet, or now it's called the, the law of, um, mobility and responsibility, which means whenever you sense that your mind is wandering somewhere else, you take your body with it and you go somewhere else. Now, this is open space as a facilitation technique, and this is already great also using to use in an organization. I have done this a lot, and John as well. For example, um, if there is a really heavy issue and then you bring everyone together and just everyone is invited to suggest the topics that really need to be clarified and people get together and clarify these topics and when they are done, they are done and they approach the next one. So this is already great. However, open space in the sense of Bossa Nova goes even a bit further and it goes further in that way that open space is also used as a strategy, meaning that space or speaking of a conference that break is always happening or that space is always open meaning at every time people can suggest any kind of idea they feel is really important and uh, just to give you one example not sure if you have seen it on this map john was explaining to you earlier there's for example wl gore the outdoor equipper and they run that way which means that everyone can suggest a new feature, a new product at any time. And if there are enough people who have the passion to work on that, this product or feature is a go and they make that happen. So open space in a bossa nova sense is based on invitation. It is really helping to bring together the passion of the people, which also means it's not that we are coming up with job descriptions and then bringing in people and put them in those boxes of the top descriptions. It's more that we leverage the potential or the innovative power of the people and work with that. So the people are really defining what kind of products we are developing. Okay, next one, John. Well, since this is uh, sponsored by Sociocracy for All, I'll spend very little time uh, on this slide. The, the, the main principles, as you, um, most of you I'm sure know, are, are top-down uh, is balanced by governance from the bottom. And uh, the, uh, there's hardwired feedback, and um, uh, the, that hardwired feedback comes through the double linking process. Oh, here we go. Um, uh, the, so the, the, the left picture is the typical top-down structure and the right-hand side shows um, policymaking happening through the involvement of representatives uh, using consent. Um, there is a, a equivalence with paradox, I would say. You have both top-down as well as bottom-up. 
And how do you do both? You do that by uh, going back and forth between what's top down and what's bottom up so that you have um, a organization that thinks together. You to, do you have anything to add to that? I'm gonna, I think, go on to start Agile. I, don't you wanna say something about consent decision-making? I, 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 said, I said about that, that they make this policy decisions by consent and consent. Yeah, but what consent decision-making is? I mean, okay. because I'm not, I don't believe that everyone is coming from the sociocratic field. Okay. <laughs> um, consent decision-making is a, a method that nature uses. It's how the elements of a system actually make a decision together. It's what can we live with? Uh, what can we accept as opposed to what do we agree to? And it involves both the uh, uh, body, paying attention to your body, as well as the kind of whatever logic is being offered so that um, the um, acceptance, good enough for now, safe enough to try, is, is uh, felt deeply and everybody can commit to it. Mm -hmm. uh, Agile, I'll start that out. Uh, mm -hmm. you, this is your area of expertise, Yuta. Um, uh, agile, I like to think of as, as very compressed, rapid cycles of development and delivery to a customer. The customer is always right there with you, either in your mind because you're developing something you're going to deliver in three days to them, or uh, they literally sometimes can, can join you in your production process. So you avoid the... Um, idea of what's called a waterfall where you plan everything out and you program to that plan and 18 months later you deliver something that you're all proud of and of course doesn't work. Which goes directly into this inspect and adapt cycle that you're seeing there. So it's always learning from, for example, the customer or from the technology that's used or from the process or from your peers or from the needs in the market and then adapt, adapt accordingly. So it is, has built in this feedback loop more from in the process than compared to what uh, John just said about sociocracy where it's built in the structure. So now you have heard all of the four different disciplines of Bossa Nova and they all add together to the values and the values are the ones I um, kind of introduced earlier. So transparency, self-organization, continuous learning, and constant customer focus. Yep. We would like to give you some time to read through these definitions of the values right now. So we hope you had enough time. So John, do you wanna introduce us to... Um, Sure. Um, this is the second part of the presentation. Um, the, um, the, the, in, in combining all these different uh, methodologies, creating a synthesis, we did not come up with a, uh, a recipe uh, because what we're advising is that we have an emergent practice. That means that we encourage everybody to um, uh, synthesize um, the, or excuse me, to, to develop what they're doing through experimentation. This comes out of Kinefin, if you're familiar with that, that says you can't analyze a situation if it's complex and emergent, you can only probe and then uh, sense what's happening and then respond. So that means that we encourage everybody to think about the situation in their organization or company and then use the, the theory, the concepts that we've combined in the book to think, well, what would happen if I tried this uh, based on this theory? There, the theory says that uh, uh, this, this, this new thing should work. And you try an experiment and you publish to your peers like good scientists, what's going on, uh, what happened with your experiment, reflect about it and try it again. So that's how you implement these concepts, not with a, a checklist. So in essence, the book is providing you with an overall concept that you can then use as the basis of your experiments. This actually goes also back to that question, um, do we talk about how to make it operational? 
that's how we make it operational. And uh, we have um, brought with us a few of those probes with experiments. So you hopefully get an idea of what we are talking about here. And um, the first one I want to uh, get over is uh, what we call is trust cheaper. And the, the situation is, or the background for that probe is very specific, for example, that in many organizations and companies, travel expense procedures are really, really annoying and pe most people hate it. Whenever I talk with people about them, they say, oh no, this is really kind of a, a, a pain. And I know even some people who decided not to travel anymore because it's too painful to do that. And the thing about those travel expense procedures is they have been designed the way they have been because there is always the fear that people will abuse the use yeah, the, the budget or the, the way of, of traveling and spending too much money or so. And that's why there are these different controls and checks and procedures in for ensuring that this is not done. Now, our hypothesis is that actually in the end, those procedures really cost more because you have all those controls in and they are really demoralizing and with that, or, or frustrating, and with that, they might even cost way more than the figures you can put to them. Now, for the experiment, you measure at first, how is it, how do people see the travel expense procedures here in your organization, in your company, and um, so how does it work and how happy are they with them? And then you try your experiment and I come to, to different examples right, right away and with a few units and then you post survey and compare and see if this is helpful or not. And if it is, you can, of course, roll it out to the whole organization or company. Now, I want to give you uh, two examples. So one company I know, they did this and what they came up with as an experiment was, well, actually they have only three rules. And the first rule for any kind of travel people are doing is, and what they are booking and what they are expending for the travels is, well, it has to be legal. That's kind of an easy thing, I guess. The second thing is, um, it should be sensible. So not really kind of you're spending, uh, going to a, I don't know, a six star hotel if this is not necessary for whatever various reasons. Um, the third rule is you have to take care of yourself. And it's really this way how they describe it. So whatever that means is up to the individual person and the company trusts every individual person to really deal with that. So, and for example, if I would think about taking care of myself, I probably would not making any additional connections on long flights because that would mean I would really get there absolutely tired. And so, but it depends on the people and that's fine. The background, a little bit of that is also companies trust their people to be responsible, for example, for projects that are worth uh, millions, but they don't trust them to spend the travel expenses right. However, this was just one example. Another experiment from a different company, they came up with a completely different idea, much simpler than the one I just gave. They just have one rule, and this one rule is whatever kind of expenses, not only for travel actually, whatever kind of expenses you are having, there's the one thing you have to do, which is putting it on your intranet, on the intranet. So if you will, it's kind of a peer control because if I spend money, for example, what they do as well, so this company is, um, if I think I need a new computer and I spend really loads of money there, then probably one of my colleagues will ask me, oh, what is that for and why did I need so much money for that computer and what's so special about that? So 
the thing again is for a probe, we have a background, we have a hypothesis, we have an experiment. The whole thing is set up so that it's also safe to fail um, in, in many ways. So in the one way, the people who say, oh, I'm happy to participate in that experiment, they are safe. So no matter if they go for it or if they don't go for it, and it's also safe to fail, so nobody should be punished if the experiment is a failure because actually there's no real failure because there's always learning. So this was um, like the one, one probe with an experiment you can do. Another experiment, and, and I, we don't wanna go in such details now for the next one. The next experiment is failures as opportun uh, opportunities. Very often we hear companies state that, saying like, oh, fail fast is important. And actually I'm not so sure if I'm really buy into that. What I think is really important is to learn fast and fail fast is just one option to hopefully learn fast. However, what I see a lot is that um, in companies, this is kind of a, um, yeah, it's, more a lip service, it's said that, well, we wanna learn and failures are okay because we can learn through failure. But it's very rare that this is also true for the top. So at the very top, maybe people say so, but hardly anyone in the company has ever heard somebody from top management saying, oh, this is a failure I've made this week and this is what I learned from it. So the thing is, you need to do things like, well, in, in the Agile community, this is called a retrospective, where you reflect on stuff that has happened, for example, the last week or the last two weeks or the last month, whatever time period you want to look at, and see what you are learning from it. And in order to really make that a culture in the company, you have to make that transparent as well, what you learned from it. And only if you do this on all the different levels in the hierarchy in your company, it will become a culture, not by just saying, well, it's important for us to, to fail fast and then learn fast. So this was kind of the, the second probe. I want to uh, also present a third probe which is actually something that we learned from a bank that they did that. And um, the thing was for that bank, they decided in the meeting room where they had their board meetings, they decided to get rid of this huge table. Actually, I don't know if it really looked like that. So this really huge oak table is kind of impressive. However, so they decided to get rid of the table and do their meetings there without a table. And what they realized is that the communication got way more open and honest. And even more that, than that, what also happened was that the communication with the rest of the company also got more open and honest and more interactive. So just by removing the table, they had a, a huge difference that they implemented. And so this is now, this example is actually not a, a probe that we have suggested. It's something that we heard or overheard a company, in this case, a bank did and successfully did. So summarizing, there was a question earlier about how do you implement this and uh, this diagram shows how. The first thing you do is hurry up very fast and sit and do nothing. Think. Successful leaders tend to be those who reflect and everybody's a leader. So you reflect and you think, hmm, I have a bit of an inspiration. We have this problem or this opportunity in the company. And I remember that uh, those concepts out of Bossa Nova say we should maybe try this. And so you design a probe. Is that true? That uh, we removing the, the, the table from the uh, um, uh, boardroom will help make more honest and open environment. So you design that probe, you try an experiment, you're a good experimenter when you do it. You might have a control group if you can, or at least do a before and after measure. 
And then when you get the results, sit and think about it. Um, the, uh, it's, it's really important for you to also publish this to your peers in the company, maybe at a conference, but that's really an important part of the scientific process. So that's how you implement Bossa Nova. The, um, the Bossa Nova, um, I, I, my, my favorite story of the people that we know are using it so far is Titansoft. Uh, that's a software company in uh, Singapore and in uh, Taiwan. And they have a, a theme of we never stop developing. And Titansoft is the only company that is consciously now using all four of the Bossa Nova methodologies that we know of. Um, they even, one person there has even gotten our book translated into Chinese. So Titansoft is one of our heroes. Okay. Why don't we conclude this, Yuta? Uh, many thanks for, for uh, listening to us. We look forward to questions. This uh, slide here at the top has a blog site, the Agile Bossa Nova, and we invite you to visit it to um, see the latest things we've been writing and to uh, let us know how you're doing in um, playing with and experimenting with these ideas in the book. Thank you, John and Yuta. That was amazing. Um, so looking to the audience, like if there's any questions at this point, and um, what we can do like right now um, with you um, put a question into the Q&A, we will bring you into this room so you can actually speak your question. It looks like somebody raised their hand. Uh, if we know of any nonprofit volunteer run using Bossa Nova, I guess, John, this is more your topic than mine. So there's this question. And it's okay. Val. Hi, Val. Good to see you. <laughs> this is great. The, um, yes. Um, um, let's see. Um, there are, are organizations I know of that are a combination of, of volunteers and um, um, uh, the, and in fact, I'll use, I'll use the uh, sociocracy for all as an example. You've got some staff on sociocracy for all. You've got about 60 volunteers and um, you're all the time using open space and you have the sociocratic structure. Um, you're just now getting to be using uh, the, um, uh, the, the beyond budgeting process because you're just introducing budgeting. Um, and so I'm, I don't know if you're exactly asking for an example or an analysis, but the, there, I deal with a number of organizations that are using a lot of volunteers. So I, I'm not quite sure how to ask or answer that further. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I, I heard that we should repeat the question. Actually, I thought I did. So the question was, do the authors know of any nonprofits volunteer run using Bossa Nova? So I, I actually read it out, but maybe um, that was not in the right point. So any, any other questions? Here's one from yeah. uh, Xavier Oak. It says where and when uh, we can be trained as a Bossa Nova trainer. I have read your book, but can't find some of your slides in the presentation that seems important to me. Uh -huh. Actually, I can answer that. So, you will find slides um, on SlideShare. And so there are a lot of slides out there. And you can also find um, a lot of recordings and also articles and blogs on the edge.bossanova.org. Um, and actually, you can also just use it. And, I, can, I, yeah. I can add to that that... Um, uh, I am actually offering via uh, Sociocracy for All a, a course on facilitation that 
I'm trying to incorporate um, lots of ideas that are not just from sociocracy, but from the other traditions. And so I invite you to try that out if you want. Just check the, the Bossa Nova website. Uh, right. There's another question here. Uh, is there a tight and soft case study or write-up? Yes, in our book is a, uh, uh, an insights box that uh, goes into some detail about that. And actually there's more than that. And I just um, provide the link because there's also a blog on the Titan Soft write-up. So I put in the answer in that q and I'm not sure if this worked and if everyone really was able to, to get it, I hope. Then there's another question by Dan Parson. Oh, it works. Good. Um, is there one component that is more difficult to overcome than others? In my opinion, I would think budgeting might be the most difficult because how they are structured and back to your point, the bank is only open once a year and that's a difficult mindset change in respect to finance. I could be wrong. Um, I would say actually, um, <laughs> A typical consultant answer, it depends. Because what I have seen also a lot that people were saying, implementing double linking is really the most difficult thing because it really requires a lot of courage. And often um, management doesn't really understand that it's not about giving up control by implementing double link, but this is kind of what people sometimes feel or fear, I have to think. Um, and yes, for other companies, probably beyond budgeting and giving up the, the annual budget feels like it's a really uncertain terrain, but actually the opposite is true because it's, it's not working anymore to have a, a yearly budget. And if, if I talk at least to companies, they all say, well, we have that annual fixed budget, but then if a project needs more money, they will get that. And if I say, okay, and if they don't need more money, but use less, um, what's happening then? Well, nothing. So it means when people got the money, it will never be returned. So it's not really a flexible process. And so it's always for the, hmm, let's say, for the bad of the company, which is also the reason why those CFOs have created that or discovered that way of, of working. And the good thing is that especially for beyond budgeting, there are quite a lot of large companies really doing that. So that's a good thing. And still, they are probably also companies who would say this is uh, the most difficult thing. A Dan Parsons says, yes, it's very painful yeah, and current processes don't work well in an agile environment. Yeah, that's true. And what people often try to do is um, do more of the same and then they figure it's not really helping. There's another yep. question here. Yeah, ben, Benoit says you chose four key practices. Did you leave away other practices or aspects? Yes and no. <laughs> the uh, there are many other practices out there. For example, on the, the chart where we listed all the different choices we had, there was Joy Incorporated. Uh, and there's a book called Joy Incorporated. And we didn't really try to pull all that in. Uh, the, um, there's some wonderful work being done by Modrigan and um, the other things that we, we just are learning about. So we felt we had to uh, focus in on some that we thought were really uh, important, knowing that we would be revising it as we went. Anything else on that, Yuta? Yeah, well, I would say we were really influenced by a lot of different streams. I wouldn't call them practices, by the way, or I would streams or disciplines is something I, I would use. Yet those four seem to really address four completely different aspects of a company. So um, beyond budgeting is more on the strategic part. So bureaucracy is more on the structural part, actual more on the process part, and open space is really more on the, I would say, the invitation of the people part. And I, I know 
I'm saying that and I hear already my friends from, for example, sociocracy, this is all about people too. And it's also about processes and beyond budgeting would say the same thing. And it's also about structure and so on. Yet still they have kind of these, let's say different fields they are coming from. And with that, where they are coming from, this really provides a full picture of a company and not only looking at it from one specific angle. And still, we have been also influenced by other streams and disciplines. Um, okay. the, I, Valerie, I saw your chat. I just wrote you a note back that has some suggestions for your all volunteer organization that's physically separate. Um, <laughs> the, that's, there's a. Lisbeth, I guess, is uh, how do you compare Bossa Nova to other organizational methods such as safe, less, and how would you explain the differences? That's your area um, yeah. more than mine, Yuta. Yeah, so safe and less are really more about scaling agile. They are not so much about what does actual mean beyond IT? And also now here, I hear some people already saying, ah, oh, but we are exploring this as well and so on, but they don't have the focus on it. It's really still on IT and maybe looking from the IT, of, IT field out there and see, okay, a little bit, how does it fit in? But I have not seen so far anyone in safe less or nexus or whatever those names are um, looking for example on at the legal structure or um, also not how to to link different uh, teams and areas and departments as sociocracy does or as bossa nova does so the scaling Agile methods. Actually, this is you. You say here to other organizational agile methods, and actually they are not organizational agile methods. They would also all say they are scaling agile methods. And well, Safe has it already in the. Well, they both have it in the name. So scaling agile framework is, um, for example, like Safe, Safe names. Um, so they look at the agile aspect only. Actually, a little bit. Sometimes I fear that with that in mind and thinking of using this for the whole company, it still looks to me a little bit like that hammer that John was pointing out at the beginning. So then I see suggestions like, okay, also the board of directors should meet in a daily scrum or have a backlog that helps them organize their stuff. And, and yes, that might be helpful for them, but it doesn't make the company overall more agile and i i like to think of uh or, or test, test what we're putting out there in uh very different businesses like uh does less or safe help with running a restaurant with a bunch of short order cooks not exactly it, it's it's like it's very there's still very software environment focused as opposed to overall uh the full range of what people do mm -hmm. There's another question here that's sort of related uh, from John Badgley. Uh, why don't you take it? Uh, so the question is, what do you consider to be the three key points of differentiation between Bossa Nova and enterprise agile transformation as we have been in the third wave of business agility since 2010? Um, actually, I would kind of look at it the same way as I did for safe and less, because also there for enterprise agile transformation, it's always from the agile box. Remember the title of our talk? It's an unrecipe and it's more about thinking outside the box. But here I always see that people think of the agile stuff as this is I don't know, world peace. And maybe it would be, I don't know. I, I'm a big fan of it, I, I, I hope you know. But um, it's not the only good thing out there. And there are a lot of people who have put a lot of effort and energy into other stuff. And we know that other stuff is working, like beyond budgeting, it's working. It's out there like sociocracy since the 70s. And, and it's these are proven principles, which actually is also a big point for Bossa Nova. It's, if you will, there's nothing new. 
the only thing that's new is the combination of those, those proven principles and practices. So by putting these different streams together, and uh, that's, yeah, just uh, the, the big difference to, I would think, think outside the box. <laughs> I like the next question. And how about we take that last question and then move to end, and then anyone who wants to stay on can stay in chat. Does that work? Yeah, well, actually, the next question is kind of an ending question. What stream to be integrated next? What's the next letter in the acronym? <laughs> so, the, I, I, I want to answer that. We, yes. we're, we're watching uh, uh, Titansoft because that is exactly their approach. It's like they are never done developing, and so we're wondering, what are they going to do next? And uh, the, th that's part of the fun and the mystery of it. And John, I think, I know we are over time, Lorene, but I think, John, you need to take that next question, which is, what about the people, e.g., the hardworking blue-collar workers, the nurses, the service agents, what's in it for them? Are they included? Yes, and that's exactly why I said uh, safe and less are not the answer. The, exactly. This needs to work for all those people. And, That's and it why does. You came up and it with does. The, I've, I've, the, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, being down in Anacostia in Washington, literally uh, next Monday, uh, talking to exactly uh, that environment. And, and it has to work for everybody, or it's not a truly agile approach to things. Mm, and that's also how we looked at it, actually. That's kind of, that's the, the out of the box thinking. So, very good question. So, I guess, and we answered all the questions quickly. Loreen. Just a deep thank you for um, showing us and teaching us and making us more aware of it. And to everyone who showed up today and the questions you asked and how they deepened and filled out the conversation, thank you.